In your community, no doubt, there are many religious groups that will meet on Sunday. And when they gather for worship, a part of their worship will be singing. But along with that singing, there will be the use of instrumental music. It's also possible that in your community there is another group known as the Church of Christ in which instrumental music will not be used. I am a preacher for the Churches of Christ. And I've had people ask me, why is it that you do not use instrumental music in worship to God? Coming from a religious world where the use of such is so common, when they find a group that does not engage in it, they find it interesting and they ask questions. Why is it that you do not use instrumental music in worship to God? Today we're going to deal with that matter. And I began by simply stating to you this very fundamental fact. We do not use instrumental music in worship to God in the Christian age because we do not have authority from God to do so. Now in the course of our study today, we will expand our study to explain that more fully. But for now, just let that simple point register that we do not use instrumental music in worship to God because we do not have authority from God to do so. That raises the question, of course, well, how do we receive authority from God? And the answer to that is that we receive authority to, from God through the Bible. The Holy Bible is God's Word. And Paul the Apostle said, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto every good work. And through the Bible, God either gives us commandments to do something, or we have examples of people doing that which God has commanded. And each of those would give us the authority from God. In some scriptures, we learn what God has said, and maybe He's told us specifically what to do, and we have that instruction to follow. In another scripture, He may tell us something to do, but doesn't give us specific instruction. And that specific instruction not being there, we study the Scripture, and from that which is given, certain things are inferred, and certain things are authorized through that inference. Through those means, God authorizes what He wants us to do in worship to God. And as we continue our study today, those are the matters that we are going to explore. I have with me today Brother Ryan Rourke who is the preacher for the Cole Harbor Road Church of Christ in Mechanicsville, Virginia. Ryan, welcome to the program. Thank you, David. And we're glad to have this opportunity to study this very matter together. Ryan, talk to us a little bit about this, of how we receive our authority from God regarding music especially. The scripture that you quoted from 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, a couple of words jump out. Verse 16 talks about uh, the scriptures being given and that they are profitable for these things that you listed there. Verse 16, doctrine, reproof, or correction, instruction, righteousness. They are profitable. And then verse 17, the, the word that jumps out there is the word complete, perfect, as you quoted it from the King James. The New King James says complete. And so when we talk about getting authority from God, we are talking about having things that are profitable for us in these areas and being complete or perfect. And so when we think about music in Christian worship, it occurs to me that it is so important to have authority from God for all that we do, all that we teach. We think about having authority from our boss at work. Uh, when we think about our parents and having authority from them to obey them. But when we think about the God of heaven, the one that created us and st sustains us, uh, it, that ought to be utmost in our mind, to have authority from God for everything we do. Well, we do have biblical authority, divine authority for singing in Christian worship. I'll take you to a couple scriptures. The first one is Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19. Ephesians 5, verse 19 says this, Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, and so there in Ephesians 5.19 is the authority 
or singing in Christian worship. And then we flip over to Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, which says this, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, and there's that verb again, with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And so Ephesians 5.19, Colossians 3.16, both mention singing, and there's the authority from God for doing so. Now, there are a few things in these verses. Number one, the what kind of songs are they to be? Spiritual songs, songs that are rooted in biblical thought. Number two, in those verses, we have a specific kind of music that is vocal music. And then the third item we have in both of these verses is that it is congregational in nature. And so, David, there is the authority for uh, congregational singing in Christian worship. Now, you mentioned how we have authority from God. Well, if you go through the New Testament, you will find no example, no command, and no inference, no implication that music, musical instruments are to be used in Christian worship. It is vocal music that is authorized by God in His Word, and so that is why we do it the way that we do it. Well, here's a question, though. You and I, and certainly everyone probably in our listening audience, our viewing audience, rather, uh, has, has heard people and their justifications for why it is that they use instrumental music in their worship to God. And I, from personally, have heard several uh, justifications and reasons why my friends, whom I love dearly, my neighbors, my family, choose to use instrumental music in their worship. What do they say? What, what, what do they say in, in justification for it, David? Well, one of the things that <clears throat> has been offered to me um, for an example is this point or this contention that, well, the Bible may not command it or give us an example of it, but it's just an aid. It's just like a, a songbook. And when I have preached on this before, and I would point out, as you just did, that Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3.16 tell us that we are to sing and make melody in our hearts to the Lord. The person would say, yes, I see that, but you see, I'm not looking at it the way you look at it. They would say, I'm looking at it simply like it's an aid that helps me, just like a song book would help me. Well... So let's, let's consider that, that very matter. Is a songbook an aid? Well, indeed it is. It aids us in doing that which the Bible specifically commands, which is singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to one another and unto the Lord. Is the playing of a piano or the playing of an organ or the playing of a guitar and so on to the accompaniment of that hymn, is that just an aid? Well, it may be an aid to someone personally, but it is much more than an aid. It is another kind of music. Now, let's, let's clarify the matter in this way. Think for an example that we're going to obey Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3.16. And so the church is assembled to worship, and we're going to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Okay, we're we ready to do that. Okay, so what song? All right, well, someone says, well, let's do How Great Thou Art, and then Rock of Ages, well-known hymns. Okay, let's start. Well, how are we going to start? Well, in order to start in our worship to God, we are going to sing these words at some pitch. You can't sing without a pitch. You've got to have a pitch. You've got to have a tempo. And if we just all, all start on our own, it'll be chaos. So we've learned that it is an aid to the singing if we have a director, someone who can direct us in the singing. And so if we as a congregation then have a leader, a director, we follow his direction. And he is an aid to us. Okay, now let's go back to the scenario. We're going to worship. How are we going to worship? We're, he's going to start us. It's going to be How Great Thou Art. I think I know all the words to that, but I'm not really sure I know all the words to all of the verses. So um, will we do it by memory and just take our chances that we know it? No, we see that if we have those words printed out and we can follow those words, 
and follow the notes that accompany the words, that's an aid. You see, that's what a songbook does. It aids us. But now notice this. When the director announces the number, when he gets the pitch, and he starts to direct us in the singing, and we're following in a book or off of a page or off of a screen, and we're following the words, all we are doing is singing, which is what the Bible requires. But if we then have someone that starts playing an instrument, a mechanical instrument, guitar, piano, or whatever, now we have done more than add an aid we have another type of music that we are engaging in for which we have no Bible authority. So it is not just like a songbook. It is another type of music. To one more point, to illustrate that one more step, while you're singing, just stop singing and have the songbook, and there's nothing going on. While you've got the guitar or the piano playing, stop the singing, and the guitar playing or piano playing continues, you still have a type of music going on. The songbook is just an aid. The piano is more than an aid. It is another type of music for which there is no Bible authority. What do you hear that we might benefit by studying today and sharing with our audience? What kind of defense or justification do you hear sometimes here? Well, David, the, the justification that I hear, in addition to what you've explained a lot, great job, by the way, one of the ones I hear a whole lot is something to the effect of, well, the Bible doesn't say not to. The Bible doesn't say not to use a piano, an organ, a guitar, what have you. Uh, the, the Bible is silent on forbidding it. The Bible doesn't forbid instrumental music in worship. And you know, that's, that's a, a good question, it's a good point, and it's something that needs to be taking a look at. And think about this. I had a friend one time who asked a question about this Bible authority matter. And I said, okay, friend, if that is the case, if anything is permissible that God has not specifically said, you shall not fill in the blank, then uh, what would be stopping us, friend, from, from say, playing a game of baseball, getting a, a diamond and maybe the, even the auditorium, uh, choosing up sides, getting nine per side, getting a baseball bat and getting on the pitcher's mound, having a game of four or five innings of baseball, and we call it worship to God. And foolish me, thinking he would say, well, Ryan, that's just ridiculous. I wouldn't even think anything like that. To my surprise, he said, well, you know, now that I think about it, I guess there wouldn't be anything wrong with that after all. I probably wouldn't choose to do that myself, but I don't think there'd be anything wrong with it. You see, and that's where that argument logically ends. So we're talking about the silence of Scripture, and the, the main question here then is, the silence of Scripture, does that permit us to do anything, what it's silent on, or does, uh, does the silence mean we just have to go with what is authorized by what is commanded, what has an example, or what is inferred or implied by a Scripture? And as David has pointed out, and as we've talked about already, we must have biblical authority by that example, by that command, or by that inference or implication. And so, when the Bible is silent on this matter of including instrumental music in Christian worship to the God of heaven, we are without Bible authority and therefore we will not use that addition to worship. And as David's pointed out and taught us very well, it is an addition, not an aid. And so David, that's something that I see a lot and hear a lot, but I'm sure you have something else that you hear a lot also. Well, yes, I, even as you brought that up, I was thinking uh, about um, an argument that was made to me one time in a, in a conversation that I had with a person about music. And this person said, he said, well, okay, I don't remember the, all, the, all the points about it, but he said, I heard my preacher talk about that. And he said, now, my preacher said that over there in Ephesians 5.19, the Bible says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. And he said, it was that making melody, that that comes from a Greek word. Then he said, I think the word was solo or something like that. And, and he said that that word means like playing a guitar. And he said, wouldn't that justify it? And so I said, well, let's study that matter from a very careful standpoint because indeed if it is justified, 
I'm wrong for saying that instrumental music in worship is sinful. And I do teach that. I believe that, that instrumental music in worship to God is sinful because I don't think we have Bible authority or authority from God for it. But if Ephesians 5.19 does indeed justify the use of instrumental music by the word from which making melody is found, then I need to know that. So we did a careful study. Now here, the fact, here is the fact about the matter. The word solo there, in a different form from that particular spelling, is found in that scripture in the Greek language from which our English translations are taken. And the word originally had a meaning of like to pluck or to, to move or to, to twitch or to like pluck the strings of an instrument. It had to do like with playing a, a, a harp or a guitar. And that would be the fact about the original meaning of that word. And in the English translation, it is translated, making melody in your heart to the Lord. And I said to my friend, I said, but if you, when you look at that scripture carefully, then you realize this, that that word or that scripture says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And the words to yourselves there, or Colossians 3.16, which Ryan referred to very capably earlier, says that let the word of Christ dwell in you richly with speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing to one another. In other words, it is a congregational action that is called for. It's reciprocal. Those, those words to yourselves uh, in Ephesians 5.19 translate a Greek word that is a reflexive pronoun, meaning I sing to you, you sing to me. So it is that kind of action that is called for. In other words, and you, this is crucial to understanding the point, what Paul commanded by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is that we are all to engage in this action. Whatever the action is, we're all to engage in it. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now, if singing is required there, and it is, then it is required of everybody. So having special singing groups up in front of the congregation, a, a choir, a quartet, and so on, is not authorized in the Scripture. Congregational singing is what's authorized. So that is authorized, and there's no dispute there from anybody that would carefully and fairly examine the Scripture. If the words making melody, translating solo, authorizes the use of instrumental music like plucking the strings of a guitar or a harp, it does more than authorize it. It is required. And it is required of everybody. Because the action that is called for here is an action that is to be engaged in by everybody in the congregation. Singing, everyone singing. And if it, if it authorizes playing an instrument, then everybody's to be involved in that. So everybody would have to play an instrument. Because if it authorizes it, it also requires it. But notice this. Making melody there is a verb. Solo is a verb. It's a word of action. And a verb has an object. Like if I say, I throw. Throw is the verb. I throw what? I throw the ball. Well, if it is a word of action, it is a verb, it is a word of action, what is the object of it? Well, the object of the verb is never in the verb itself. The object of the verb is stated here, and the instrument that is specifically stated is the heart, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Ryan, this scripture says, Singing by everybody in the congregation is required. And there is nothing in the Scripture that authorizes the use of an instrument of music. Instead, Paul simply said, the instrument you're going to use in making your melody to the Lord is your heart. And it comes down to that whole matter that you referred to a moment ago. How important is it to us 
to have authority from God for what we do in worship to God. Now, is there something else that you want to bring up as a, one of the attempted defenses of music? Your mention of the instrument, the harp, <laughs> makes me think of, of Psalm 150. And I've had many a friend and family member and associates who say, well, I seem to remember somewhere in the psalm, they might even call Psalm 150, where David employed the use of a harp, a literal stringed harp, in his worship to God. And so they will say, does that not authorize the use of an instrument in Christian worship? What we must understand is that David lived under a different covenant, the old covenant. And I once heard someone say, and I heard you say it also one time, that one of the most important, if not the most important pages in the Bible to understand is the blank page that separates the Old Testament from the New. In other words, the change of covenant. And read through the book of Hebrews sometime and, and you will see the stress that is put on the different covenants and how they apply to whichever one you live under. Well, we live under the Christian covenant, the Christian age, the law of Christ, the New Testament, which we are governed by, which we follow with all our hearts if we are to be pleasing and love the Lord. David was a what? A Jew living under the old covenant. We are a Christian. We aspire to be Christians living under this new covenant. And so what David did in his worship to God way back then under the old covenant doesn't have a whole lot to do with what we do today. Now, as Romans 15.4 says, we can learn and, and be admonished uh, through the, the hope that's given uh, through the scriptures, that is the Old Testament. But when it comes to justifying our worship and what we do and what we uh, do, do in worship to, to God in the Christian age, uh, that, that shouldn't enter into it. An example to think about. Well, if I wanted to uh, burn incense and uh, bring a, a calf into the church building and lay it up on a table and start roasting it, start sacrificing it like David did also back then, would that not also be acceptable? Most people would object to that and say, that's not necessary, you see. That's under the old covenant, under the old law. We don't do that today. And that is precisely the point, David, understanding the covenant system and the testament system. Well, that's an excellent way to word it. And I, I find this point coming into my mind that if you can go back there and prove that he played on that harp with the approval of God, you'd have difficulty even proving that from the Scriptures. But if you could do that, it still has no bearing on us whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And I know that you've heard and, and, and I have heard the point made, and it is a valid point that the, the person who today attempts to justify the use of instrumental music in Christian worship because it's found in the Old Testament is doing the same kind of reasoning that a person would have if he said, I'm not going to pay income taxes because Abraham Lincoln didn't. This has no bearing on you because Abraham Lincoln lived under a different time. His, he wasn't subject to the law of income tax. Right. And so we are subject to the law of Christ, not to the law that came through Moses. Well, we only have three or four minutes left, so let us in this period of time kind of summarize that which we have stated today in order to make it just as clear to the audience as possible. Friend, what we said to you today is this, that in the Church of Christ... We understand that having authority from God for what we teach and what we believe is crucial. And you know, really, if it's not crucial, if it's not important, then you just open the floodgates to everything and anything. Just do whatever you want to do. And if there's nothing in the Bible that would indicate that that kind of worship is acceptable to God. God has made it clear throughout history, even under the patriarchal and mosaical ages, that the only actions of worship that are acceptable to Him are those actions that He has authorized. Only those. Now then, if that is the case, then this is a crucial matter. And we have authority from God in the New Testament to engage in the singing of psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing to one another and unto the Lord. We have no authority from God in the Bible to engage in the use of instrumental music in Christian worship. Ryan, I have been saying for quite some time this statement, and you can give me your reaction to this. 
Congregational singing is the only type of music that is authorized by God for Christian worship. Is that right? It's a tremendously concise statement that pretty much encompasses the whole thing that we've been talking about here today. And I stress concise because that's an impressive way uh, to put that. And David mentioned the, the, the phrase type of music. And when you get down to it, how many types of music, when you get to the most fundamental point, you boil it all down, how many types of music are there? Two. You have vocal music and you have instrumental music. And so the way, David, you have put it there has been tremendously helpful to me and I trust helpful to our audience as well. Well, thank you for that. And I, I just want to emphasize to you, the viewer, that this really does come down to the matter of how important is it to you to have authority from God for what you do in worship. It's not a matter of opinion. It's not a matter of personal preference. And it certainly ought not to be a matter of just following some tradition, family tradition or church tradition. It really is a matter of, has God authorized use, the use of instrumental music in worship to Him if he has not, and you engage in it, then you are doing something for which you have no authority from God. And that is a dangerous matter. Think about this, but don't take my word for it and don't take Ryan's word for it. Open your Bible and study the Bible yourself to see what the Word of God teaches you about this matter. Worship. It's an important action, and God either accepts it or He rejects it. And the Bible teaches that He accepts only that which He has authorized. And there is no authority in the Scriptures for the use of instrumental music in worship to God. We do have authority and a requirement to engage in vocal music, congregational in style, but no authority for the use of instrumental music. Thank you for joining us, and I hope you have a pleasant day.